So back to the crooks of things here, back to the NASA Apollo moon missions here that we firmly believe did not happen. Right. You want to look at the watch. Yes. Let's go back to the watch. Okay. And there's another image of the watch that I have, which is 65 in the presentation. Ah, okay. I see it now. Because that relates a little more closely to what we were talking about, these spacesuits just being costumes. Yes, sir. And you can see that on the top picture, they have shot down the glove. You can see how far that ring is down inside that gauntlet. And so that's just right about where the watch band would be. And then the red ring, which is on the sleeve, is about three and a half inches apart. It, it simply isn't connected on that suit. And that watch, of course, is 14 minutes after 11. Absolute Flagstaff time that it's on. And it should be on UTC time, which it would be actually 14 minutes after 4 o'clock in the morning, is what the watch should say. Yes, it's another interesting piece of the puzzle here. Yes, and we have a friend of mine listening for sure from Australia. I'd like to say hi to Tim. Oh, yeah, greetings. He's out, there, he's out there listening. He's a film expert, by the way, in the movie industry. And he actually showed me exactly how to do the simulations for the landing and everything else for the Apollo missions. He showed me quite technically how to do that. And he was using the Superman video as an example of how to make something fly. But yes, now we are back to looking at Buzz Aldrin's glove here with the watch. If you look at the timeline and when that photograph was taken, that photograph was taken 56 minutes after he set foot on the surface of the moon. He set foot on the surface of the moon 316 UTC time. So it's, and it's an hour, it's 56 minutes after that when this photograph was taken after he set foot on the moon. So it should be basically 414 is what the watch should say. And it says 14 minutes after 11, which is Arizona time. Is it safe to say they were busted? They've been busted up, down, left, right, and sideways, and nobody <laughs> will believe them. And I mean, that's been going on for 40 years. I mean, by the time you get into the early 2000s, when Marcus Allen and David Percy did all the photographic examinations and everything else that really proved that it was on a set with the multiple lighting and the shadows and everything else, right? And what Bart Sabrell has produced, how it was being filmed and how they inserted the image of the earth in the window and stuff like that, people still don't believe it. So all of those people are encouraging me to come ahead with the evidence that I now have showing exactly how this thing was set up, how the timeline, when they were there, all of the photographs with the color plates and the actual date and everything else on it. I mean, it has the photographer right on the color plate who is doing the shooting of the film. Not only on the film, but it's on all of the photographs, all the magazine photographs, right? Those color plates are there for every one of them, and they're all available online. NASA's not hiding it. That's the interesting thing. Slide 12 is the color plate for Apollo 17. And the, the date on there is actually a couple of weeks before they even took off. November 28th, 1972, right? And then when you look at the rest of the detail, it shows you the camera and everything else on it. But it also has the photographer and the inspector right there. I mean, those people were not on the moon. So why would their name be on the color plate? And the other thing is, is people say, oh, well, they did the color calibration before they took off. That was done beforehand. Well, that's impossible because if you did a color calibration on Earth or the magazine for the camera, and then you stepped into space, you're now going to get the full spectrum of light, included UV light, which completely alters the color of everything, right? Black right. light. If you're below the ozone layer and everything else is filtering out all that UV light on Earth, you wouldn't be able to do the color calibration and have anything come out. If you're on the moon, you're going to have the full spectrum. It would have to be calibrated there if they did a color calibration. And those people wouldn't be involved. By the way, you <laughs> saw the um, video of that rendition from NVIDIA 
that uh, graphic, the video game graphic card company, where they basically mapped out the moon. Yes, and they absolutely got it right. They did it just like any other photocopier. They took an image and they reproduced it and digitized the whole thing with their software. Did exactly as when that sunlight is shining there, they reproduced the diffusion of light through atmosphere coming off the sun. They got it exactly right. That's pretty they crazy, proved, right? Well, they were trying to prove that the reflective light mm -hmm. was coming up against the spacesuit. They forgot that the sun should just be one bright light. It shouldn't have any diffusion of light coming off of it. And they got that big halo around the sun. And that wouldn't happen in space. That only happens if you're in Earth's atmosphere. They reproduced it 100% and proved that it was on the Earth. I don't think I mentioned that to you during our last interview about uh, that company sort of recreating the moon landing here. You can uh, animate anything, right? That's right. They just proved okay. they could easily be faked. They just proved that you could fake it through animation. Right. But Disney was doing that before anyway. How ironic. It seemed like a lot of them were sort of... Uh, some of them really didn't believe we went either. You have to realize that NVIDIA had a contract with NASA to produce graphic cards and cameras and stuff like that, right? Capture cards. Very good cards, by the way. Yes, they are. I use them all the time. They're excellent. That's how I look at the photographs, using their technology to find all this stuff. But they actually canceled the contract to produce anything for them because they could not meet the requirements. The radiation was just destroying their cards. It's on NASA's report server. It has all the test results from laptops, screen displays, and video cards are all on there. And I think the best laptop that they had lasted 43 seconds before the radiation took it out. This particular photograph here on the slide 27 is the actual lowering strap that they used for the simulation to lower it down on the gantry crane, right? And they're before these straps and they were attached at the top of the landing legs. And you see the shape that they can just loop on and hook onto them. So when they lower it down, when they relax, they just slide off again. They used the hammer and the feather and dropped that. So when they took the photograph of the hammer and feather, they were able to capture the actual gantry strap in there. Right. And of course, nobody notices that the gantry strap is there. They're looking at the hammer and the feather. Right. This is how the astronauts were able to photograph all of the fraud within the simulations. It's a prime example. They are the whistleblowers. They were showing you the damage that was done when they took the photograph underneath the, the Apollo 15 to show you all the damage that's there from that. All of the other equipment in the related photos around it, the stuff is just thrown all over the ground. People criticize me and they go, well, why would they do that, right? Well, these people were really upset. Three other friends died. And the only thing they had they couldn't go to the media or anything else. The only thing they had available, the astronauts, to document the fraud, to document that it was just a simulation, that it wasn't the real thing, were the Hasselblad cameras. And those were just props for them. The professional photographs with the Hasselblads were done by professional photographers, and those were maybe three or four dozen that were used for media purposes only for magazine, newspapers, whatever. The rest of the time they're out there, they had them just as a prop on their chest, but they were actually working cameras. And they just kept taking photographs of everything they could out on the set. So if there's a piece of metal sticking up out of the ground, or if it wasn't, they dig it up and take a picture of it. They kick open a rock that's got spark plugs in it, there's rocks in it. If somebody left a beer can laying around, they took a picture of it. There are no random photographs. These guys were very dedicated in defending the lives because of the deaths of their three comrades. That's exactly what they were doing with these cameras. And they were risking the lives themselves and their families at the same time while they were doing this. 
Another good example of the simulation of cards are the cue cards, which we haven't talked about. Ah, yes, the cue cards, which is way up there. Ten. They're pretty good examples of it right there. Basically, these are little cue cards for the astronauts because it has the exact time that they have to shoot it because they only have so much on the camera. They got four minutes of film, so time is there that they have to shoot it. The camera settings are there for them. Where they're going to be standing, all the rock locations are there. I mean, if you're supposed to be on the moon, you can't have these details in there. What should be in the cue cards for them is all the metering for their life support systems. This particular cue card gives them a description of what they're supposed to say on camera, on what the mineral contents were when they walk up to a rock and crack it open. It shows them. Which direction the sun is going to be? I don't know how you know which direction this rock is going to be sitting. All of that's there. That is just to shoot a scene. That's exactly what those cue cards are for. And of course, in number eleven, that is for the Grand Prix. That's where they drive the rover around. It's called the Grand Prix. You can get it online, and it shows where the cameras are going to be positioned. It shows where the craters are that they drive through one around the two, and then around the last one. And park it, and that's exactly what you see in the video. That's for Apollo 17. It actually has Jones, and that's the guy that's in Apollo 17, who's the inspector. That shows where he's going to be standing, so you don't want to get him in the shot.、Right? I mean, with the helmets on, they couldn't even do hand signals because they're blocking half of their view. So, for each different scene that they set up for each station that they're at, and Everything that they're going to find and document is already filled in months ahead of time on these cue cards, and they're done there so they could practice it in the first place and do it for the final simulation. I mean, even the timeline when they're driving the rover—I don't care where you are. If you're、right. driving a bush buggy, you can't tell me that you're going to be there right to the second to the next spot where you're going to stop. This shot here. From Apollo 16, also has lettering on a rock. When you go up to a driving range and you grab a bag full of balls, a hundred balls, they used to make little ones for golf courses that look like little golf bags.、Mm. And because it's owned by the golf course, GC's golf course, right on the bottom of it. I think I remember you saying they were even playing golf at one time. There are golf balls all over the set everywhere. What do you think these guys are going to do in their spare time when they're building the set, and they're out there? It's just a big driving range for them. The initial shots in Apollo 11, the very first shots before they even got out, there's golf balls all over the place, and that's not there. It's everywhere. Almost any shot you can find golf balls on the set. You just need a good Nvidia graphic card, turn the DSR up, and away you go. 45 is the C rock. Is found in Apollo 16, but the photograph on the left is Apollo 11, and that arrow is showing is the same rock in Apollo 11. They're on the same set in Apollo 11 as they are in 16, approximately the same spot. That was a pretty big gantry crane. They didn't move that around much. That thing's about 300 feet wide and 600 feet long and 200 feet high. For simulation, it could lift the lander 180 feet in the air. And come down on the simulation, and there's even videos showing how it works online. And it was all set up at Flagstaff on Cinder Lake. But that C rock is there. That rock is in every Apollo mission. I'm showing it in 11. That's it in 16 is the C rock. Anybody else wants to do the research through these photographs and do the study that I have and find them? All you have to do is send me the file numbers when you find the rock, and then I'll know you've done this. Research.、Um, take us through slide fifty-three now. That is the Sandusky vacuum chamber, the Glenn Research Building in Sandusky, and that building was, I think, one point six billion dollars in nineteen sixty-nine. It'll pull a tor value of ten to the minus six, one hundred and thirty miles off the surface of the Earth. No human being or spacesuit has ever been tested in it. They put other equipment in and test and see what the off-gassing and everything else is on it. But what I'm showing in the the photograph are the 
eight foot thick concrete walls plus another two feet of aluminum and steel plus a titanium ceiling ring in there to hold back one atmosphere on the outside to a toward of the minus six vacuum on the inside you need that much structure and now you have to believe that that spacesuit on the left hand side is as structurally as strong as that building is and still remain flexible it's interesting really people just say well it's one atmosphere 14 and a half psi and when they get a a hole in the space station they'll take a a canister with 15 pounds of air in it and they'll open it up and they'll say that's how fast the air goes out and that's how they claim the space station would leak down at but we have other examples on earth that you can use that's true a slight variance in the barometric pressure if you happen to be in florida and the two pressure differentials are there which is maybe a quarter of a psi is sitting out there over the ocean when those two lock together and try to equalize themselves i mean it creates a hurricane that'll rip your house to the ground or take your car for a little bit of a flight right and knock it into your neighbor's yard that is the power of the differential of air pressure another good example of a vacuum against an atmosphere is a lightning strike when that lightning comes down splits the air and it comes back together you hear that clap of thunder scientists and everybody else say a vacuum does not suck well that may be true it can't suck on nothing because there's absolutely nothing there but when we put something in an atmosphere like a container with air pressure in it as air mass air molecules if that air Mm -hmm. tries to escape they claim that the vacuum doesn't suck so it has free space that it can run into and it will accelerate in a molecular free space close to the speed of light and the effect of that if you had a hole in there everything's going to collapse so fast it would be like an explosion going off these are examples of the type of seals that you need to use here on earth to create a vacuum like when you get out past a tor value of 10 to the minus six you're into metal seals and they have to be compressed down tightly to hold that seal they can't be active seals they can't turn like when you look at the new design of the artemis suit the thing slides back and forth at the waist around those are active seals sliding back and forth they will work up to a certain level of vacuum but certainly once you get out into space they're not going to be functional at all as soon as you turn them they'll just start to leak and they can't be rubber because they'll just tear right off but when you see that kind of a seal and then they tell you with that kind of compression on it and they tell you that a vacuum doesn't have any force well they're trying to compare the force of a vacuum to psi there are two different scales completely and people need to understand that the tor scale is a measurement of the force of the vacuum psi is measurement of molecular structure and if you also try to compare a vacuum to being underwater underwater is completely different when you're underwater and you're in a suit the structure of the suit really doesn't matter as long as you compress the air inside the suit to match the pressure of the water outside the suit itself has zero pressure against it there's nothing happening with the suit it's only when you have a differential that it has to make up when you're in space the suit itself has to maintain the entire force of the air pressure inside plus the differential of the vacuum and the vacuum is infinite the force of the vacuum is infinite even einstein said a teaspoon of a pure vacuum is stronger than the total force of the entire universe it's absolutely infinite and as you go out through the atmosphere and this is where people don't understand how very little we are traveling into space we're traveling in the upper atmosphere is what we're doing when you get up to the top of mount everest you've already reduced the air pressure down to the point where you actually need oxygen as a human to breathe when you're in an airplane at 35,000 feet 
The reason why they don't fly higher than that, because it's far too dangerous for commercial aircraft to fly higher than that at this time. 39,000 feet up is called the coffin line. Like the layers of the atmosphere are defined, they are as defined as water to air, like the surface of a lake to air. There's just that much less dense when you hit these layers. The coffin line is called the coffin line because if you fly above that in a normal aircraft, the aircraft becomes unstable because there isn't enough air across the wings to create lift. The only way you can fly across above the Kármán line is you must be supersonic. But I have a photograph of Alan Bean from Apollo 12 using the fuel transfer tool. That's uh, despite the pressurized gloves having mostly no mobility. The thing is, is you're in a full simulation and those gloves can function beautifully because they're not pressurized, right? Right. Most of the documentation from NASA claims that they couldn't grasp a hold of anything under an inch. Their thumb and their finger would be an inch apart. They couldn't grasp anything smaller than it had to be an inch in diameter for them to be able to grab a hold of something. They couldn't handle very fine tools or machinery, and they didn't have any really with them. That's where the Artemis suit, the, the contracts are out for the robotic assist to open and close the lid. Still hasn't been designed. 50 years later, it still hasn't been designed. And we haven't even gone back to the moon. Well, we haven't gone back to the moon because they're afraid to simulate it. We'll find out. <laughs> Anyone looking into the NASA documents, anything in the last 10 or 15 years, they're working with Boeing and Grumman and a few other companies. They're developing engines for commercial flight airplanes, right? And they're looking at supersonic and hypersonic drive engines. Our skies are so full of planes right now. They need more space. They need to be able to fly higher and faster. So they need that 40 to 50,000 feet and that 50 to 60,000 feet in there for super and hypersonic flight. That's the two different things. And they need two different types of engines to fly in those ranges because of the lack of oxygen. And that is what you're going to find if you go looking through the documentation from NASA. That is their focus. It is not on traveling to the moon. It's not traveling to Mars. It's not anything. They're working with those companies for commercial air flight. The problem that they have when you get up above that 39,000 feet is if you have a leak in an aircraft, if you have a window blow it, if the pressure goes down, you don't need to have the oxygen mass come down. You are a low enough vacuum at that height, you will just simply die within seconds. You're Fully embolize your blood, you just boil it. No second chance, there would be no survivors, there'd be no nothing. And that is the problem with flying higher than that. If they have an accident, there's no give at that height. And that's why at 35,000 feet, they can drop down oxygen mass, get the height down, and you'll still be alive. That's where the money's going to, that's where the focus is. That photograph 57 is taken right from a press kit it's also in the Lunar Journal as well, showing the flight path. And it also in those files has a complete description on the telemetry that they were expecting. It doesn't have the actual data of the telemetry, but it shows exactly the flight path that the craft was taking. And the only way you can do a translunar injection is you must be in line behind the Earth at the equator to shoot to the moon. You have to be exactly on the backside of that. You can't be in a different flight path. And if you go to then 58, it now shows a different flight path. Ah, yes. And you got to realize the millions of people that watch the launch. This thing's showing it launching and going across the United States, not out over the Atlantic. Then you take the next number 59, now it shows you go part way around the Earth and then turn left and go up and over and down and around and out and shoot underneath the South Pole to go to the moon. You physically have to use a lot of fuel to stop the direction you're going and a whole lot more fuel to take it off in a different direction. Even the translunar injection to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth is somewhere 
to launch it, even if you're on a normal path, is 260, 280 tons of fuel that you need extra that they did not have. And there are lots of mathematicians out there that have worked that out, which means you'd need two more Saturn V launches into low Earth orbit just to provide the fuel to do the translunar injection. 64 is another example of them trying to lie their way out of the Van Allen belts, showing that they skirted around the outside. Like the Saturn V rocket was claimed to have lifted 130 tons of cargo. That's its maximum. You need another 300 tons just to do that maneuver right there. Yeah, I see that now. And anytime you make a maneuver in space, you're going to use a lot of fuel. You have no other friction. It's not like driving a car. You can't turn the wheel and it continues on there. If you give up a little blast, you'll rotate the crash. You're still traveling the same speed. And you're not traveling at little speed. You're traveling at 12 kilometers a second. And you've got 130 tons you've got to slow down. That's like putting uh, bicycle brakes on a train. And of course, once you change it one way, then you have to stop it from doing that again by more fuel, right? And they do know that. And what would be the significance of the mission, Apollo 11? The Apollo 11 mission was to prove that uh, the United States was a superior nation in all of its technology and as a military force. Not only that they could go to the moon, but they could be in space, just like the Space Force, right? And control the planet with uh, physical force from space. It shouldn't be off trying to say, oh, we're going to the moon, we're going to Mars, we're doing this, we're doing that, right? Because we all know the Orion spacecraft have been sitting around for 10 years and they're still trying to fix a couple of heat shields. I mean, that's longer than the entire Apollo missions all put together just to fix a heat shield. So where's the snag there? But it's a double-edged sword at the same time. Right. Because if you tell all of these people that all of this technology already exists that you can go there, then those guys aren't going to invent it. Yeah, it's a hit and miss. Double-edged sword. Yeah. By the way, Scott, I just wanted to jump in here really quickly and add on to something. Well, not even to add on to something. I don't think we've ever even mentioned Apollo 13 and what caused that accident. I don't think we've ever talked about that, me and you, Scott. Well, it's pretty simple when you read through all of the data. It got pretty high. Oxygen tank exploded in the upper atmosphere. It separated, landed in the Atlantic Ocean. The Russians picked up the capsule the next morning and handed it back to the U.S. It never did the flight around like you see in the movies. And when they picked that capsule up, there was nobody on board. It was an empty shell. I mean, it was documented. It was, it, it was in the Russian newspapers. What was it initially that first made you question what you saw? I think the first video I watched that really, really got my attention was James Collier. Is 1997. It raised way too many questions. Uh, the second one I watched was Marcus Allen. Marcus Allen. That's what I said, I've got to look into this myself. When you believe something, when you believe they landed on the moon, like I said, I grew up in high school. It was, I was just flooded with it. Those kind of things. So when you believe it your entire life, looking at all the documentation of NASA, when you read it and you believe, you don't see anything wrong with the documentation, right? Right. It all looks good. Oh, here's the test results. Okay, there was a failure here. Well, they must have corrected it. They're showing you that this was a failure, that was a failure, and this had to be done, and they had problems with the wiring and this and that and the other. Well, of course, they must have fixed it because they're all PhDs, engineers, everything else, right? Of course, they fixed it because they went to the moon. It must have happened. You don't even question it. Yeah, it was on right? TV, so of course it was, it was real. Right. And then James Collier, you sit there and listen to it and they go, well, why did they destroy all the data? Why is this? Why won't that guy let me have a look inside there to see how big that is, to see if it's even big enough for him to get out of? This thing looks like it's put together like a piece of garbage. And in fact, it is. Right? And when I watch one of Marcus Allen's presentations and he's going through the fact that this is a actual studio setting and there's the additional lighting but i'd like yeah. to thank david percy <laughs> for taking me seriously because i probably came out of the blue he's been around forever 
right? It's not that I wasn't there. I just wasn't expressing myself publicly to anybody else. And people need to know. People need to understand. We need to know the truth. We need to know where the lines are, what we need to develop, because it all comes back to where we live. We have to pay more attention to the corporations that go out and destroy this planet, especially the mining companies, oil companies. They can go out and destroy the planet, and people will say, oh, don't worry about it. They made a big mess there. We went to the moon, for God's sakes. We can certainly clean that up. Actually, no, we can't clean it up. We didn't go to the moon, and we're going to leave it with our children and our grandchildren to deal with, deal with, deal with.